professor, researcher, uh, educator here. Um, but he has another career, which I'd like to tell you a little bit about. For the last 20 years, he has also had a career in communication and broadcasting, presenting television and science, science and medicine programs, both in Britain and now in Canada, including Don't Ask Me. By the way, feel free to ask him today. Uh, Don't Ask Me and Where There's Life, both of which were top 10 TV programs in Britain for eight years. His series here in Canada, Magic or Medicine, won, a Magen uh, won him a Gemini Award, which, as I'm sure you all know, is the Canadian equivalent of an Emmy. And together with someone uh, that, uh, that we all uh, uh, revere, I'm sure, those of us of a certain vintage, Monty Python's John Cleese, he has produced or is producing a series of 50 videos providing the basic facts on a variety of common medical conditions. Uh, a number of books, 14 in all, he has published, including How to Break Bad News, a textbook for physicians, What You Really uh, Need to Know About Cancer, a comprehensive guide for patients and families, his book, Can We Be Good Without God, a national bestseller in Canada. Perhaps we'll have you back to speak on that one next year. Uh, and cancer is a word, not a sentence. Now, I have to read the last item in his CV, which I'm sure he has crafted uh, with uh, great care. Uh, he is married to a gorgeous and brilliant Canadian physician who believed him when he told her he had an immense personal fortune and a serious heart condition. <laughs> He is trying, he's currently trying to acquire one or the other, and I would suggest you acquire with one and, and not the other. <laughs> Dr. Robert Buckman. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I mean, uh, thank you, David. Um, it is a very, very nice introduction. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about stress opposite. That's, that's what I'm, I'm committed to talk about. And the first, uh, the first thing I want to say is um, it's not our fault. Um, stress and our reaction to it is built in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, uh, basically talk about very, very quickly recognizing the personal signs, uh-oh, I'm in stress. Well, that's not actually all that difficult. You know when you're stressed. You start swearing and dribbling. Um, and, um, not, not actually interestingly, having heart attacks. Um, we, we used to believe, um, when I was a medical student, that heart attacks were uh, basically, that the input of stress was huge into heart attacks, the, the so-called type A personality, and the the type AA and the type AAA. Just as a quick definition, I'm sort of filling in time because you're all coming in. It's, no, don't hurry, don't hurry, it's okay. Um, the type A personality um, is defined as the, the kind of person who flushes the toilet before finishing peeing. <laughs> now, I have an argument with that because that would only apply if you're a male um, or perhaps a contortionist, either way. The, the, the triple A personality is the kind of person who would flush the toilet before he even came into the washroom. That, that, that's the kind of, uh, probably the kind of person I am, you know, it's, I'm probably a triple A. But the point is, we are, and, and moderately serious, but I'm, I'm not going to be too serious about this, um, we are hardwired. Um, it, it's built in to our reaction to the world to be what we now call uh, what, we, what we now recognize as stress. We are actually hardwired to react quickly um, to bad things, to threats of any description, which is probably how we got to be the dominant species on the planet in the first place. There are many anthropologists who would say that the evolution of the limbic system, which is the, 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 the reptilian brain, part of the, the lower part of its A system in the uh, in, in the midbrain, um, it, 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 comprising the uh, amygdaloid nuclei, which uh, harness emotion and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and include the, the in part, the medial parts of the temporal lobe, that limbic system, that loop, is actually the secret of humankind's dominance on the planet. In many respects, the emergence of the human species is actually really the emergence of the limbic system. Um, which is a lovely way of thinking, and the, a human being, you know, like us, yeah, we're all human beings, right? It's merely the limbic system's way of producing another limbic system.
So you see, it's interesting. Somebody once said, you know, that a, a human being is a sperm's way of producing another sperm, uh, which I thought was uh, relevant, relevant. But anyway, the point I am making, and this is just a sort of preamble, is that our reaction to threats is instantaneous and very, very, very powerful and very deep. And it is not surprising that it is very deep because it's built into the limbic system. And that isn't surprising that it's so deep because it is the limbic system that over the last probably one and a half, two million years led to the emergence of the human species. So we're taught, we, when we're fighting stress, we're actually fighting the most ingrained system um, in the entire human uh, way of dealing with the world. So um, to put it very simply, we can't win. Okay, uh, now I'm going to show you how to. Um, now I'm going to show you how to, how to minimize, me, minimize the effects of, of stress, if at all possible. Well, there we go. Um, to, to, to put it very simply, it's all about emotion. Everything is about emotion. We remember things with emotion, we deal with emotion, we respond to emotion. The limbic system handles emotion, which is why we, we, we recognize um, uh, emotion is the most important thing. And I'm just going to tell you, just tell you one, one, one quick, quick example. Um, David mentioned that um, uh, I, I spent a lot of time, at some time anyway, at the MD Anderson, the, the University of Texas. And this is very, very important. This is how, how the importance of emotion um, can be ignored if you're not paying attention. And my, my academic partner is Walter Bale, who's a psychiatrist. And he told me this story that happened two or three years ago. He was going around ward consults with the fellow in psychiatry. And the, the fellow, they met a new patient, and, and the fellow said, you know, how are you doing, Mrs. Brown? And she said, oh, it's terrible, you know. Uh, oh, it's just awful, you know. Um, my whole life has fallen apart. And my husband died very suddenly of a heart attack last Wednesday. And it, I just my entire life has fallen to pieces since then. And the, the, the psychiatric fellow just stood there, not really having any idea what to say. And he said, yes, yes, I, yes, I see. Um, wasn't it Thursday? <laughs> you know, which is there, is, there is no question to which wasn't it Thursday is the correct answer. You know, <laughs> and what he had done was to ignore the limbic system response. He ignored the emotion. The important emotion was this woman said, my life is falling apart. I mean, if the psychiatric fellow had been an insurance agent, and if this poor woman's insurance on her husband had, had run out at midnight on Wednesday, it would be very important to know whether he died on late Wednesday night or very, very early Thursday morning. But that wasn't the case. He was a psychiatric fellow. I mean, he's, he's probably selling second-hand cars now. <laughs> no, that can't be. He's in Texas. He's probably a professor. Um, <laughs> So I'm just seeing whether you're still awake. You know, you know, I'm not sure I am, but I know you are. That's very, very, that's very good. So the important thing is emotion. And what I'm going to show you when I eventually start my talk, which I will in a few minutes, um, is how to recognize emotion and how to change your own. And the changing your own emotion is extremely difficult because I said you're fighting three million years or whatever it is, one half million years of emotion, uh, of evolution in the limbic system, and you're trying to cope with it uh, within the first, you know, ten seconds of a really stressful situation. So. Um, in many respects, emotions are extremely powerful. And emotions, uh, this is a rather cheap analogy, um, but I, I think it's quite a valuable one. Um, it, it's quite useful. Emotions are like the dark matter of the universe. Do you know what dark matter of the universe is? No, neither do I. Um, are my cataracts getting worse or are the lights? Oh, okay, okay. okay. Um, is this, is, this, is, this, is this all right for you? Okay, yeah, okay, okay. If you actually, um, if you fall asleep because of the, the poor lighting, um, could I ask you to raise your hand just before you fall asleep and we'll boost the lights up, you know? It's, 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 um, isn't it amazing for all of those of you, you we're, we're all alumni, right? Yeah. Um, isn't it amazing how soporific those three words First slide, please. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it? There you are, Saturday morning, you're going to stay awake, right? You know, and as it first slide, you're gone. 
What is it, 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 when they run out of anesthetic in the anesthetic room in the OR, they call up a biochemist and he, all he does is he walks into the, in the anesthetic room, he says, first slide please, bang, they're asleep. You can cut off their leg. Um, how do you wake them up? How do you wake them up after you've fallen asleep on first slide please? Are there any questions? Everybody really, really wakes up, oh, yeah, 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 and try to remember what, what, what they said in the lecture. Okay, okay. So dark matter. Dark matter is basically what happens at the end product of black holes. And it, it, what happens is, as you know, uh, matter condenses or appears to condense, um, and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier until a black hole is made of dark matter that is so heavy that light itself cannot escape from it. So dark matter is invisible. Apparently 50% of the weight, the mass of the universe is composed of dark matter, which we can't see. I always wondered, how the hell do they arrive at that figure? <laughs> how, how, how do you do that? You want to weigh the universe, the cosmos. Okay, so you put the entire cosmos in one scale pan. What do you put in the other? There's, there's nothing, right? Anyway, the universe that you can see weighs 50% um, of what it should weigh, apparently. 50% of the mass of the universe is dark matter, which is so dense it is invisible, but it changes everything. It changes the path of stars and light and everything. And everything that should go like in a nice straight line, if you go like that, uh, it takes a dog leg round dark matter. And it's dark matter that changes things. So dark matter is invisible, but changes everything that comes near it. Hence my analogy, that's emotion. Emotion is invisible, but it changes everything. I mean, you know, love, hate, anger, any emotion you care to, care, care, care to mention changes the way we react and we respond to each other, but it is invisible. Um, just as a quick, a quick uh, by the by, dark matter is the exact opposite of visible matter, um, photons, for example, um, which are, um, they have no mass, they don't effect, affect, they don't have any effect and they don't affect anything that they come near. They are completely irrelevant. They are highly visible, extremely bright and, 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 and glitzy and showy, uh, but they have no effect on anything. And there was a move, as you know, about two years ago, that they would change the name of visible matter um, into uh, Sarah Palin matter, which, which I, I, I like very much. Uh, isn't it extraordinary? Isn't it it's amazing? I mean, I'm very glad we're here in Toronto. That, you know, we're not... Is it quite, and people say, she might be president in 2012. Oh, God. It's, it's, you know, isn't that really, really, really worrying? You know, um, anyway, um, that's not relevant. So dark matter is like emotions. And responding to the emotions is the most important thing. But what I'm going to talk about this morning is how to change your own emotions. I'm, I'm going I'm to step ahead... Um, uh, quite quickly, but this is the most important slide um, in the whole of medicine. Um, if you could, and in the whole of life, actually, how to make visible dark matter. I'm going to deal with it very, 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 very quickly here. Um, it, there, there are techniques, and the one I'm illustrating on this slide is called the empathic response, which I think it's, the, it's actually the only one I know. But I make it sound like I've read, you know, like 20 of them, um, and that this is the best. I haven't. Uh, this is the only one I know. But the most beautiful thing about the empathic response is it's a way of making the dark matter visible. And you do that simply by making it, as it were, verbal, speaking the, the, the emotion that and until that moment ha hasn't actually got a name. And you do that very simply. You identify one of the emotions that the person is experiencing, you know, hate, anger, upset, distress, fear, shock, whatever. Don't, don't, nothing fancy about this. Just any old word, a, a plain, simple English word, upset. That'll do fine. That'll do fine. Um, and for instance, that psychiatric fellow could have said, your husband died on Wednesday. You must be very upset. That, was a brilliant, that would have been a brilliant empathic response. He didn't. He said, wasn't it Thursday? I've got one quick, well, I've got one quick example. Which this, I, I'm now building the empathic response um, into the interviews for medical students. I, I, I'm on that, that, that committee. The U of T is fabulous, by the way. Really serious. They take entry into medical school very seriously indeed. And they had this uh, big, big committee, and we, we review the patient, the candidates' charts uh, and the patients' charts if, if they fail. Um, uh, we, we, re we review them and we interview them and so on. And I, I thought I would build in to my interview, which is, it lasts an hour, very, very, very strict, very good, um, the empathic response. So for the last few years, 
I've been saying to the, the candidate at the end of it, I, I want you to do an empathic response. And I, I, I give them that, that slide. Uh, I tell them, you know, the, the three steps. Identify the emotion, identify the source of the emotion, which is usually what you've just said, and then respond in a way that shows you've made the connection between those two things. Like, you know, that must have been awfully upsetting, your husband dying on Wednesday. Um, and unless you hated him, of course, in which case you're probably very relieved. Um, unless you're very, very rich. Um, are you seeing anybody nowadays? You know, uh, you know, <laughs> he didn't even do that, the idiot. You know, anyway. So I thought I'd build this into the medical student interview. So I say to the medical student, the candidates for medical student, imagine, um, I tell them what the empathic response is. It takes like 15 seconds to explain that, just as so you're seeing it on the slide. And I say, imagine uh, I've had a heart attack. I'm in your emergency room. You're a physician. I've had a heart attack. I had chest pain. And you've done the ECG, and it shows I've had a small heart attack. Um, and, and I've checked on this. You know, it is an inferior uh, MI, you know, uh, no rhythm of disturbance. So enzymes are actually not very, very raised. So my chance of dying of this heart attack is, you know, one or two percent, very small indeed. Um, and even getting a recurrence is less than five percent over the next two years, five years, and so on and so on. So you, you, you tell me um, I've had a small heart attack, okay? You say, you've had a small heart attack. Now I, as the patient, I'm going to react, and I want you to use the empathic response in a way of responding to that reaction, okay? And, well, can I say yes? I say yes. And I say, you say, um, it was a small attack, a heart attack. Oh no, that's terrible. Now, most of the candidates say, you know, um, this is obviously a shock to you, um, or you're, you're scared, or you're very angry, or you're upset. Or One of the candidates, I think it was about two years ago, leant forward to me very, very closely, and she said, I did say it was a small heart attack, you know. <laughs> Which she did. Yeah. It's only a touch of rigor mortis. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm sure it'll soften up over the next few days. You know. You know. Um, you know the, uh, now, what, there is a punchline to this. There's a great punchline. And I said to her, and I, I was with a, 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 another co-interviewer, so I'm not making this up. I said to her, yes, you did say it was a small heart. That's true, but you didn't do what I asked you to do. What I asked you to do was to acknowledge the emotion. I went over it again. Identify one of the emotions, identify the source of emotion, responded away. I said, we'll do it again now, okay? So you say it was a small heart attack. And I said, oh, I said, oh no, that's terrible. And this time she said, um, you're obviously very shocked by it. Brilliant. She, like you, had learned the empathic response in 15 seconds. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. She started off by responding to the Sarah Palin matter. I did say it was a small heart attack. And 15 seconds later, she said, it was a terrible shock to you. The point I am making, a very big deal indeed, is acknowledging, making visible uh, an emotion is not a very big deal. You can, you can learn it in 15 seconds, as you, as you all just did. The important thing, and this is what I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start my lecture in a minute or two, I promise, um, uh, as soon as the stress goes down. Um, um, the, the important thing is to recognize the circumstances in which it happens and to change your own mood. Now, um, I, I, advert, advert, um, for those of you, if you are um, on the fringes of medicine or involved in medicine, um, all of this stuff, everything that I'm talking about um, today, uh, most of what I'm talking about today, uh, is coming out in my new book, um, which is an attempt to teach physicians how to use the empathic response, or to use the empathic response. Um, and it, it, it's called, um, it's, it's coming out, it's a textbook, it's, it's, it's not interesting to the general public, but, it, but it's a textbook for, for medics called Practical Plans for Difficult Conversations in Medicine. And it sets out in detail in print, um, this, and also there's a DVD included in the book with examples of how you can do this in real life. So if, if any of you have physicianly friends or you are interested in this, as it were, particularly in teaching, and actually I, I'd almost say in life, uh, because uh, these techniques are so important. Uh, it is coming out properly. Uh, in fact, it's coming out next month, uh, in, in Johns Hopkins. The, what I'm going to do today in the next uh, 15 minutes is I'm going to deal with one aspect for recognizing the circumstances in which stress comes to the boil. Well, you know, how do you recognize when the pot is about to boil, is boiling, uh, and stuff is splashing all over the thing and is about to ca catch fire? And that's in the H 
of the H-A-R-D. I'm not going to deal with the A and the R-D because that's really, for, that's really for conflict resolution, which of course is a form of stress management. But what I'm then going to do is after the H for the, 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 the recognizing the circumstances of stress, I'm going to quickly run over my, 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 uh, a new scheme. Well, I haven't written this book yet, but I'm going to, um, which is a way of changing your own mood, getting out of the loop um, I, I, I said, you're not, you're not going to have a heart attack, but how do you get out of that, that loop? How do you stop the stress building up, you know, with the reflux and the dribbling and the high pulse rate and the, 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 the unpleasantness? How do you get out of that loop? And the, the, there are two things, the H of hard and then red car. So um, my next slide, um, is it the next slide or is it on this slide? Just talk among yourselves for one second while I look. Okay, 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 okay. Um, so how do you rec uh, uh, good 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 okay I'm going to go back that's right um, I, 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 I highlighted on that slide so how do you recognize the difficult situations now I'm saying this to you now the problem is that when we get into a snit the first thing that we do is we lose our ability to recognize. I, I, I've been thinking about this um, very, very recently, as you, you all have, with um, the, the, the recent discussion a couple of days ago about the Michael Bryant case. Um, obviously, it is absolutely obviously to me, um, you know, uh, analyzing that situation, that the courier um, got into a real snit. I mean, to call it road rage is, is not actually inappropriate. And I, I underline rage because what he lost, even before he, he sort of came to that car and tried to threaten Michael Bryant, um, he had lost all sense of perspective. His ability to recognize his own stress, and this is probably a, a feature we heard on the radio, this is probably a, a feature, unfortunately, of the, po of the poor man's life. He used to deal with things, he used to respond to things uh, by not dealing with them uh, in, in that kind of a way. He lost his perspective. If you can, try to remember these H's. Um, there should be five of them. Are there five? Uh, one, two, three, uh, four. Four, 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 yes. Um, there are five, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hazard. I know what uh, the fifth is, and I forgot to put it on the slide. Hassled. Yeah, okay, so it's hurried, harried, hassled. High stakes and high emotions. Those five add up to the, the big H, hazard. So hurried, harried, hassled, high stakes, and high emotions. All of those five um, are warning signs. When you realize, and we do, and in oncology we do the whole time, you know, um, there are, you know, we're short of time, isn't it, it's absolutely awful in the clinic, you know, uh, you, 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 you go to, see, you, you've seen three patients, and you're seeing the fourth, and you've got another, you know, five or six waiting, and um, this patient, unfortunately, has got a recurrence or something like that, which is a big deal, very big, big, big deal. And it, it, this is a major discussion. Uh, and suddenly, you're hurried. Suddenly, you're harried. Um, uh, I'm actually writing an editorial for the oncologist about this very subject. You're suddenly hassled. Um, it's huge stakes because it's a recurrence of cancer, for example. So there are big stakes. I mean, we're talking about the actual ending, you know, the potential ending, the threat of somebody ending uh, their life coming to an end, of dying, um, and it's high emotions, obviously. Obviously. So in those circumstances, the, the H the, of hard um, uh, 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 it should be ringing a bell and saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm walking into... Uh, um, uh, Turbulent waters here. Um, those are sharks. There is blood in the water. You know, right? You know, uh, as somebody said, you know, how do you deal with blood in the water? You don't go swimming if there are sharks there. Uh, well, yes. You know, uh, and in some respects, that's kind of true. Um, but first of all, recognize the hazards. And then now is the, is the big thing. And I'm going to spend the next um, 10 to 15 minutes talking about this, is how to change your own mood. How to stop yourself going into the loop um, of um, uh, in, in, uh, increasing uh, emotions. So I'm going to skip ahead to red car. There we go. Um, and I'm going to skip all of that. Um, and I'm going to go to red car. Um, red car is a very simple way of, uh, as it were, recognizing that the, 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 the heat 
uh, there's another H. Uh, yeah, the heat, uh, the, 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 the high stakes, the high emotions are rising and becoming higher and recognizing that and trying to get out of the rage or the upset or the distress or whatever it is. And the first thing that you need to do is to recognize. And I said, unfortunately, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, unfortunately, um, recognition is the first casualty, is very often the first casualty. So in some respect, if you can manage to recognize, you're probably winning already, if you can manage to do that. So, recognize. First of all, recognize your own way of dealing with stress, your own somatic language, your own body language. You know, that, 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 that fluttering pulse rate, that, do you get that, that ringing in your ear, you know, that one, um, I get that. Um, and, and then that very, it's a very strange, stirring, empty, how anything can stir and empty at the same time in your stomach, but you know, that, that strange, empty feeling, and you feel awful. And you start feeling, you know, and you may get a dry mouth and your voice may rise by about two octaves. And it, it, you may suddenly find that your shoulders are rising like that. You, and you start doing, you start talking like you're, you're, you're breathing neon or something, you know, or argon or whatever it is. Um, you, you start, so recognize the somatic signs. Learn to recognize your own stress. In your own, but so it, 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 and everybody, every, if I asked you all in this room to write down 10, nobody would have the same 10 as another person. I bet you, I bet you, I bet you. Yeah, we all have our own top 10, as it were, for how we react to stress. So recognize your own. So if you can say to yourself, I'm getting upset, or I'm getting stressed, or I'm getting, you know. Now, I, I, I admit that we all do it to ourselves. Like, for example, this morning, um, I decided I was going to try and actually be walking in um, to the, the, the foyer of, of, of uh, Sydney Smith Hall at quarter two. I thought that would be a, you know, so I, I thought, right, I have to leave the house at quarter past nine, you know, and set up my sort of, um, um, you know, the GPS because I'm geographically a complete effing idiot. You know, I, I couldn't find my way out of the bath if there wasn't a signpost, you know. Um, but, and then, then you know, it is absolutely typical of me. I put it 100 St. George's Street and it said, you know, turn right, turn left, you know. And it, 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 our GPS doesn't, you know, it's, it's very expensive. It was over $100. Um, and it, it, it doesn't swear. I love it. It says, you know, recalculating. <laughs> It doesn't say, you are such a shit, didn't I say turn left? You know, it doesn't do that. It just says recalculating. And, and I, I'm imagining this woman sitting in an office and she had to get up at 8 o'clock this morning to be there early so that when I said, you know, find, my, find the way to St. George's Street, she's sitting there with, with a chart, you know, and she's you know, calculating. She's like, oh, well, you're doing very well. You turn right when I turn right. And, you know, and then... Typically, you know, I think, what happens if I've inputted the wrong St. George Street? <laughs> what happens if this is St. George Street, Vancouver? I'm driving to or something, you know, what if I did something wrong? It wasn't, I'm here, uh, you're here. You, you were expecting this lecture, weren't you? Yeah, okay, all right, all right, okay. We're in the right place. But there, there you are, you know, you do this to yourself. I always do when I'm giving talks, and I recognize that I do this when I'm giving a talk. I always do when I'm giving a talk. I probably need that little bit of adrenaline push to actually give a good talk. You'll tell me afterwards whether it was a good talk or not. But um, I probably need that adrenaline. So I, I actually accept that that stress is actually helpful to me. But I, number one, I recognize. Then, having recognized, you know, the, the rising pulse, the, that, that sort of stirry feeling, um, that you, your sudden inability to distinguish between left and right and so on. Then examine. Now, examine means try to work out what it is that started you off. Now, this morning, that was extremely easy, very, very easy. Um, I'm giving a talk. I'm always like this before I give a talk, deliberately, and I accept it. It's, it's, it's part of the, as it were, the emotional price of giving a talk, and I don't mind it. So I said to myself, correctly, recognize I'm stressed, examine, it's because I'm giving a talk, and then pinpoint and I don't call it pinpoint, I call it diagnose. Uh, but what I really mean is pinpoint. It's just that rep car doesn't sound in the least bit good, and red car at least <laughs> sounds quite good. So diagnose, what it means is pinpoint the exact thing 
that, 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 that precipitated this. So just spend a second or two, and I'm going to explain why. Spend a second or two working out exactly what it is. Now, in real life, you might have to think back over the last day or you know, a few hours. When did I last feel completely unstressed and completely normal? Um, if the answer is when I was four years old, then I have medication that will help you. Um, uh, but ge generally, it's, you know, I've, I felt fairly okay when I woke up this morning. Um, it was only when I realized, if, ah, yes, I remember, it's when I put in St. George's Street into the, um, into the GPS and wondered whether it was St. George's Street, Vancouver. So that was, you know, that was the exact thing. Um, for example, if, if it's a medical example, if the doctor says, um, we won't have the results of the biopsy for another two weeks, you go, oh gosh. Now, it was at that moment you were expecting the results of the biopsy, which you, you know, high chance of being fine, everything's going to be fine. But you, you, you aren't being told that this minute. You're being told, unfortunately, we're going to have to go back and do an extra test on it, and we're going to have to wait another two weeks. So at that moment, you're something like, you like, oh my God, this, you know. And at that moment, diagnose or pinpoint the exact moment. So I was feeling really worried about um, when I came into the doctor's office, um, uh, examine, it was something that doctors, oh, I know what it was. It was that biopsy. D pinpoint the exact moment. Why? Why should you do the R-E-D before you come, as I'm going to explain in a moment or two, to the C-A-R? The answer, and there is an answer. The answer is because the limbic system, to which I have already referred, which is, is absolutely brilliant and has led to the success of humankind, is about six seconds faster than thinking. Um, I, I, unfortunately, the reptilian brain, the, the limbic system built into the, the midbrain, is so powerful because it led to the success of the human, human species, um, it kicks in a few seconds ahead of the, the cognitive, the, the, the neocortex, the bit, the thinking brain. So you feel six seconds before you think, um, which is exactly what happens in road rage and in all of those things. Now, the point is that if you can manage to do the R-E-D, you can fill in those six seconds. You can actually give your thinking brain time to, um, as it were, catch up with your limbic system thinking brain. Therefore, if you can do that, you might be able to look at the options. And this is the key. Uh, look at the options. Look at the options available to you. Now, uh, uh, sometimes in reaction, you know, it, it is really high stress. Um, you, 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 as it were, react reflexly, of course. But usually, um, there is a bit of seeing the options available to you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good, a, a good example. Uh, well, I mean, suppose, um, okay, let's, let's take that biopsy one. Uh, the doctor says, you know, um, the biopsy won't be available um, uh, for another two weeks, I, I'm afraid. So I'm going to tell you the answer um, in two weeks' time. Now, what are your options? Your options are to throttle the doctor. You bastard, I want it now. You know, you know, not not going to be helpful, and you will be in prison a very long time. Well, it depends which state you're in. You know, you know, uh, in Texas, you'd probably get off. You know, don't, don't worry about it. You know, um, you know, you'd probably lose four points on your driving license. You, know, <laughs> you must try not to strangle the doctor again next time. You know, um, but you know, you, so you can give in to the rage. You can give in to the despair. You can be v miserable as hell. You can decide, okay, um, I, I, I'm feeling really rotten, I know that, but there's nothing I can do about it, I'll find something else to do. When you get home, you might say, I know, I'll go to a movie, uh, or I'll listen to some music, or well, it doesn't matter, read a book, whatever it is, something, but you decide that actually a distraction maneuver, a displacement activity, is actually what you want to do. So for that, for the one or two seconds, Think of what your options are. Choose, choose. Choose um, from one from a few options. At that moment, as R.E.D., uh, as your emotions are rising, the, the temptation is to think you have no option. And that, that's road rage. And that's what happened with, 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 with that, that, that courier. Um, he, 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 was to he couldn't see any other option except to do something really stupid, um, right, to lean, lean in on Michael Bryant and, and sort of you know, threaten him and, 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 and make all that fuss, and make a, create a fight. 
it, uh, at that moment, look at your options. And then the important point about red card is that the A comes after the C. Act as a response to your choice. Okay, and the, the, the key to that is by, by deciding which of your options you're going to choose, you are acting, not reacting. Road rage, or any, any rage, for example, is, is a simple reaction. Choosing um, an action is, as it were, an action in itself, not a reaction. It's not involuntary. It's a real action. So choose, then act. The beauty of red car is that if you can manage to do this, at that moment at which you act, which might be going to a movie, listening to music, reading a book, it might be making a cup of tea, and you might actually decide just to feel sorry for yourself. You might decide consciously, I'm going to have a cup of tea, and I'm going to think about how worried I am about this biopsy result. Okay. At that moment, you sit down with a cup of tea, you are acting, not reacting. You're, the end result is the same. You're feeling upset, but now at least you have chosen to feel upset for these few minutes instead of merely feeling upset because the, the, the biopsy result is being delayed by two weeks. So the important thing about red car is that the A comes after the C. It's the choose and act. If you can actually manage to do that, you're probably giving your conscious brain, your thinking brain, the few seconds it actually needs to get ahead of your, uh, uh, your, uh, your limbic system. And then, and this is for changing uh, your behavior for the future, um, it, 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 uh, give yourself a little pat on the back if it worked. When you get into bed that night, nothing, you don't have to do anything that minute, but when you get into bed that night, I'm, I'm sure we all do, you kind of review the day a bit. Um, sometimes you do it while you're awake, sometimes you even do it in your dreams, according to that, that, yeah, that young man, Sigmund Freud, who I think is all sensible stuff. Well, I mean, he wrote so much stuff, it must, some of it must be sensible. I haven't read any of it, but I'm sure it's brilliant. You know. um, the important thing is um, that you actually reinforce what you did well. Um, the doctor told me something unpleasant about the biopsy. I decided to have a cup of tea. And as a result of that, uh, I, I, I ended up uh, watching a movie or watching a television program. And now I'm actually feeling a little bit calmer. It actually had a good effect on you. So reinforce. If it worked, reinforce. So the important, the important last step of red car is that you actually reinforce. Um, I would say that there are, there, there are three basically uh, simple um, uh, uh, rules for communication even with yourself, even with yourself. That uh, emotions are like, uh, as I said, like dark matter. I'm, I'm ending up to the last uh, minute and a half or so of my presentation. Um, that emotions are like the dark matter of the universe. They change everything. And you have, to res you have to know that they are there. You can't abolish them. You can't make dark matter go away. You can't say, you know, there shouldn't be something, the mass of the entire solar system here. I don't want it. Yeah, have it cancelled. It's not going to happen. You have to compensate for it. Knowing it's there, in, where if you want to make a straight line, you can't make a straight line because that's going to pull you over. So you have to aim over there, and then you will end up at your destination. That's apparently how you correct for dark matter. And the same is true in human emotions. Acknowledge them so that you can compensate, you can counteract them, you can react, um, you, can, you can steer correctly to reach your destination. Um, I, I put the word compliments, and I don't really mean compliments. What I mean is, um, tick what's right before you cross what's wrong. Um, and, and it's the before that matters. We all know there are things that are wrong um, in other people's behavior and in our own behavior. But what I'm saying is the world will be a much better place if we tick what's right before we cross what's wrong. Um, a good example is, 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 is judges in jury case, in, in, in court cases. Now, I, of course, I, I, I don't actually know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I've watched CSI enough and Law and Order. You know, <laughs> I know. If the judge starts like this, while it can be said that the defendant, you're, oh, you're in real trouble. He's going he's to be in a slammer for the next 50 years. I mean, he's re if, they, if they start by ticking what's right, the, the, the big cross what's wrong is coming up and you're in deep trouble. 
So uh, judges do this. Do it yourself. Take what's right before you cross what's wrong. You know, it, it is good that you. And so uh, as you're reinforcing that, um, uh, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, if you can, try to be uh, uh, tick what's right before you cross what's wrong. The, the problem is, of course, we can't do that. Um, the, you know, uh, unfortunately, we tend to punch ourselves. Uh, we, there is a tendency to punch ourselves on the nose first. But if you can try to tick what's right, I'm going to punch myself on the nose. But before I do that, I say, I did quite well. That, oh, uh, anyway, you know. Um, <laughs> so try. And as you can see, uh, humor actually helps. Try and be, uh, at least uh, try to, 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 to see the lighter side of it. I don't actually believe that in the darkest hour that's possible because like, um, like, uh, like, like, like recognizing the emotional tenor, tenor of the situation, um, humor is an early casualty in a stress situation. But um, if later on at the bottom of red car in the reinforcing stage, you are able to see the, the lighter side of it, you know that you've actually won. So the return of humor is not necessarily a cause of winning, it's a symptom of winning. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is, um, if you can actually get your sense of humor um, back, um, then you've actually won. Um, I'm going to leave, leave this slide up and then open this for questions. What I'm saying is that life is all issues. It's all about issues. Should I have turned right? Should I have turned left? Should I go straight on? Should I, you know, it's, it's all about actual actions and facts and um, uh, issues. The important thing is the emotions, both in the other person and in your own. And what I'm saying, and that's what I've said today, is uh, recognize and respond to your own emotions. And the red car system is at least an attempt to try and change your own emotion so that you can actually respond and change your mood and be in a slightly different uh, sense, uh, uh, set of emotions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, uh, thank you for paying attention so far. I welcome all questions. This must have been awful for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>